All right. Hey there, this is Bram Kanstein and you're listening to Bitcoin for Millennials. In this episode, I'm joined by Alex Gladstein. He's the Chief Strategy Officer at the Human Rights Foundation and the Oslo Freedom Forum, where he focuses on promoting human rights and civil liberties globally. He's a prominent advocate for Bitcoin and sees it as a powerful tool against authoritarianism and censorship. We discuss Bitcoin's contribution to human rights, the need for education, combating scams, innovative uses in developing regions, and advocating for financial freedom. I hope you enjoyed this episode. All right, Alex Gladstein, welcome to uh, Bitcoin for Millennials. Happy to be here. Yeah, man, thanks so much for coming on. I uh, I really love your content. I uh, I just now uh, saw you published your talk at the uh, Bitcoin conference, so uh, definitely going to check that out. I uh, I wanted you. to start with uh, shortly start with your Bitcoin journey. What initially sparked your interest? And how did your perception evolve over time? Well, it was on my radar very early and I was very skeptical. And, um, you know, we saw what went down with WikiLeaks and the banking blockade. And, uh, I mean, it just must not have registered as something I thought was really relevant for what I was doing. But I, um, we eventually started doing some Bitcoin fundraising work and accepting Bitcoin for donations at, at my nonprofit that I work for, the Human Rights Foundation back in 2013, 2014. Um, and then sometime in 2016, early 2017, the light flipped on for me. I got it. Um, we started doing some work early that year, early 2017, we did our first Bitcoin workshops. And then it's just been sort of um, uh, building and building and building gradually ever since. So now today, um, six, seven years later, we have a full financial freedom program where we do a lot of public education uh, around the world. We do a lot of grants in Bitcoin to organizations doing Bitcoin work around the world. And we do a lot of hands-on trainings with human rights activists and journalists and other people who need uh, you know, money that dictators can't stop, basically. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's been, it's been uh, a privilege. Yeah. Yeah. It's so interesting to see, right. That it takes so much time to like fully, get it i'd say right and i i well, wanted to yeah, ask and then you especially a question. It's not just that <laughs> but also you know when i first got it it was like oh cool bitcoin and then also zcash and all this other stuff mm. so it took an additional 18 months to work through yeah that 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 it's it's a bit bitcoin that's interesting not blockchain or whatever yeah. so you know finally by early to mid 2018 i i had sort of figured it out, but it, it took me a very, very long time, unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> we'll say. Well, like all the components that make it up, right, are individually yeah. are kind of a distraction if you focus only on blockchain sure. or only on decentralization and all these things, right? Yeah. But I think all all Bitcoiners kind of know that truly truly understanding it is hard and I think it, it never ends, right? But it, it's kind yeah. of like a this inward journey that challenges your previous beliefs and understanding of money, finance, all these things, right? And I want to reference a tweet of yours that I saw today and then ask you a question, but you quote sure. tweeted Alex Berenson, who's a oh, uh, yeah, yeah. New York Times a journalist and, a, and an author, etc. And he said, yeah, I've been waiting 15 years for Bitcoin to be more useful than an energy guzzling Pokemon card. What's another 15? And you said... Amazing staggering ignorance on yeah. display everywhere and it's i wanted to incredible. ask you yeah it, yeah it's crazy why is it so hard for seemingly yeah. intelligent people to grok bitcoin i mean today i saw nasim taleb on cnbc why are all their counter arguments so well, emotional i'd love to get your take yeah well taleb used to like bitcoin and then he got into clearly some sort of personal feud with somebody that's very different the average because you know he's got background from the middle east Mm. And initially, he really got it. Um, people like Berenson or the literary, you know, establishment or the op-ed yes. editors at the Washington Post, which just published another hit piece in Bitcoin the other day, or uh, the average politician or people who work for the Fed or the Treasury or whatever, the, the, their um, their financial privilege blinds them to Bitcoin's utility. It's very simple. I mean, the, the, the overwhelming majority of Bitcoin critics are people who grew up with the dollar or the euro or the pound. Um, they live in the West where we have a lot of good financial infrastructure. 
for investing in our future, for diversifying retirement portfolios, for sending money to family and friends, for paying people and merchants for uh, protection. Like we actually have government agencies that, that try to like make people whole if a bank collapses. Um, so this is very rare. Most people in the world don't have any of that. They have no, none of this infrastructure. Their yeah. currency is completely worthless outside their country. They have no way to like easily wire money to some other country. Uh, their currency gets devalued uh, at times hyper aggressively. Um, their bank accounts can get frozen for any reason. The, the government doesn't have to give a reason to just freeze it and take all your money and put you in prison or whatever. 5.7 yeah. billion people live under authoritarianism. So, so it's really just privilege like that blinds them. They, they, they can't imagine why anyone would want this because their system sort of works. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's the simple reason. Simple, yeah. simple answer. It's so interesting, right? Like, because I have it and it works, quote unquote, I, I should yeah. never kind of like question it, right? Correct. But we are at the forefront of any financial system, right? Especially in, 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 in the West. And so that privilege. But they would say that we're wasting all this time and energy and money on Pokemon cards. Like they, they legitimately yeah. don't understand. And uh, it's embarrassing. I mean, one, okay, one thing was 10 years ago, even five years ago, six years ago, I mean, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be understandable to be ignorant about Bitcoin mm -hmm. uh, if you're some sort of educated journalist or something like that, politician. In 2024, there's no excuse. I mean, we've got nations mining this thing. We've got a spot ETF. This thing's a trillion dollar asset. This, this thing's being adopted by all kinds of corporations. There's public companies in the United States that provide Bitcoin services and have Bitcoin treasuries. There's Bitcoin usage in communities all over the world. Like at this point, it's arrogance. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And so what was a pivotal moment or experience that solidified your belief as, as a tool for, I think watching, for human rights? Watching and listening to all the old Andreas Antonopoulos stuff, which, uh, which at the time wasn't old. It was it had come out like a year or two before. But you know, the internet of money is something that really made it click for me. I started to understand the framing of Bitcoin from a human rights perspective was very powerful. No one else was really doing that. Um, mm. so yeah, that really helped me. Yeah. So what, what in essence would that be? Do you say like, do you mean like that it's all interconnected? It's 24 seven, 365. No, kind of more like about the permissionless that... aspect of it. Like mm. that it's freedom money that, you know, you don't have to ask an entity for permission. There's yeah. no one who can get in the middle of you and me and rent seek off of it. Um, yeah. There's no one who can say, no, you can't do that. Um, there's no one who can discriminate against you for your gender or belief system or wealth or passport. You know, I think Andreas was extremely good at explaining the open permissionless nature of Bitcoin as its, as its superpower. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night, gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution? OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a micro SD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. And so 
you are obviously a big advocate for for Bitcoin, but within the context that you operate in, mm -hmm. what are like the challenges that that you've encountered? I mean, we we just mentioned the negative sentiment around Bitcoin was or is pretty strong from some intellectuals, right? It continues it, to be. Yeah. No, and and I think that's to be expected. The, the annoying part is dealing with all the altcoin stuff. Like that. That's really, honestly, the biggest stumbling block for people to learn about Bitcoin is our mm -hmm. scams. Like that, that, it's not government policy. It's scams. Like so, um, you go talk to anybody in any any country, and you know, predatory scams are out there, man. I mean, there are all these coins that are minted, and people try to con convince you that they're good for the world, or whether it's World Coin or Cardano or uh, what, whatever they are, you know, computer protocol, Filecoin, Zcash, whatever. Like people have their own, you know, way of explaining that um, that this coin is is good and better for whatever reason. Insert reason X here, faster, more private, you know, more fair, whatever. But but it, it just it has a pre mine. I mean, it's alloc. It's it, the way it was created was inherently corrupt at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was inherently corrupt, and it was inherently and obviously a way to enrich a small group of people at the expense of other people. And you have tens of thousands of these things, and it's it makes it really difficult to do Bitcoin education. So, you know, we'll deal with governments, but you know, the 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 honestly, the the more difficult thing that's out there is part of our basic human nature. I mean, we're never going to get rid of scams. So it's just the thing that you have to fight through to get to your Bitcoin understanding and, and um, you know, shame on people who participate in them, meaning who create them and then try to pawn them off as good things. But, you know, I think we need to have empathy for people who get caught up in them just because it's hard at the beginning. Like, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't know. I mean, when you're at the beginning, you're like Bitcoin, Litecoin, same thing, right? You know, Maybe silver to gold, like it's fine. They'll have different use. You, you don't, you don't quite understand, right? Yeah. So that's a big challenge in the space that just requires constant Bitcoin education in different languages and training and mentorship and having someone there to ask. You know, hey, I saw this thing. What do you think? And then for us uh, who are more seasoned, it's obvious to be like, oh, that's obvious. Like literally any other coin, immediate red flag. Like that's just yes. no, just, move, just don't don't focus on that. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, you know, but being humble to that and, and, you know, look, understanding, look, the other thing is the stable coin thing is, is interesting. I don't classify stable coins as crypto. I think they're their own thing, at least when it comes to like, uh, essentially shadow banks, which is what Tether is and, and Circle. Like they take deposits and they issue dollar credits, just like a bank. Uh, they have different regulations, but their product is a dollar that doesn't require ID. And it's very clear that that's a very desirable product for a lot of people yep. now. Um, they're going to collapse at some point or something's going to happen. So I, I really would caution against using them too much, but I empathize with why people want to use them. So, you know, over time and over traveling and talking to people and learning, you know, I think that, you know, what's been really solidified in my mind is that Bitcoin education is paramount. We just need to focus on it. We should be empathetic to people who need dollars, whose own currencies suck, but we should really be like, very firm against scams and, and all these other tokens that, that are just a huge drain on our attention. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said about sh shame on these people. I think Terrible they man. know what Bitcoin is, right? They, they know I mean, unless, what it is. Unless they're, they're like openly like, Hey, this is a pyramid scheme. Exactly. Come on down. Then I have no issue with you. <laughs> but if you're trying to say that you're like doing good for the world, I mean, just get out yeah. of here. This is terrible. Yeah. And so, you often emphasize the importance of financial freedom freedom as a as a contributor to to improved human rights how yeah. how do you then see bitcoin contributing to this compared to the traditional fiat system what's what's the biggest difference for human rights um well, for financial freedom yeah yeah well and and essentially financial freedom can be understood as free speech mixed with property rights right that's sort mm -hmm. of the idea um, well, look, free speech, uh, Bitcoin's unstoppable. Um, it can't be deplatformed. And that's very important as we head into a world of more deplatforming and more censorship. It's pretty simple. So that's number one. Second, private property. So Bitcoin is private property for anybody in the world. It uses math to enforce your property instead of relying on a nation state with guns. It's a big improvement. It can help anybody in any country. Um, and more than that, it protects against hidden theft, which is inflation. 
So uh, it, it protects against debasement, demonetization, inflation, all these things that happen to people's money and savings. So between free speech and property rights, it's just an incredible tool for, for, for really for anyone. I mean, especially if you're living in a developing country around the world, but, but even for people in the West, it's, I, I would say it's, it's quite valuable. Yeah. I think that part about property rights is interesting. The, the fact that property is something uh, that is, a, in my language, is, is a very difficult word that I never actually understood until Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's kind right. of the, it's yours. the difference. Yeah, exactly. Or, well, or it's your family, you or it's your corporations, or exactly. however you want to divvy it up. Yeah, but it's different than I'm. I'm trying to find a word where, like, ownership is a different word, right? Or it's kind of like when you have a title deed to your house and your name Correct. is on it. That's totally like different. The, exactly, you're like the owner of the house, but the house is not your property. Once I understood that, I also saw that all the alternatives to Bitcoin, anything you could store your wealth in or, or use as money is actually in Yeah, it's only yours as people. long as someone else exactly. agrees that it's yours. And Bitcoin yes. breaks that equation and it also breaks this, there's this ironclad law where essentially anything that can be inflated will be inflated. Yes. So that's going to happen to every single token that's not Bitcoin eventually, whether it be the dollar or the euro or Ethereum or uh, XRP or whatever. Like, any, 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 any digital asset is a, um, is, is, is virtual. Uh, you know, it's not real. It's not connected to the physical world except for Bitcoin. So yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a nice insight from, from Gigi, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah. So on your travels and, and your talks and combining that with the knowledge that most people in the world don't even have a bank account, what are some of the most innovative uses of Bitcoin you've seen in like the developing regions that, that you studied? I mean, well, uh, in my talk in Nashville, I broke this down into, well, I was like, look, you all know about savings. Obviously we don't need to dwell on that. Everybody's here because they understand Bitcoin is good long-term savings technology, but uh, commerce, freedom, and, and electric power is what I broke it up into. Commerce, it's quite simple. I mean, 2 billion people don't have bank accounts. People deal with this horrible collapse in currency. They can't, they don't have a global monetary language. They can't speak to each other. They can't make payments abroad. And, and Bitcoin is just such a fabulous technology for helping them in that area. Um, it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't require ID to use. And I have countless examples in my talk and elsewhere of that really delivering value for people. Very, very big value, whether they be small businesses, humanitarians, activists. On the freedom side, it's can't stop it. So whether you be the U.S. government or you know in the area that I work in, dictators, um, you know whether you be in Nicaragua or in China, Hong Kong, Russia, you, you can't stop this thing. So you know it's provided activists a lifeline and allowed them to keep doing their work and protest for a better society everywhere. Um, and moving even further to electric power, I mean, look, this thing saves wasted energy. So every energy site in the world essentially wastes energy, and this. Technology transforms that waste into capital. So the Bitcoin network will buy 100% of whatever you're not using. And the beautiful thing is it really kind of attacks renewable energy because fossil fuels are consumed modularly. They're not they're just like burning oil everywhere for no reason. Like they're, they're kind of consumed, it sort of matches demand. And when we have less demand, like they stop digging out of the ground and it, it sort of matches consumption. Uh, not the case with renewables. They're just like on when it's sunny, on when it's windy, on all the time if it's base load power or even nuclear like it's not not like you get to choose you can't just match it to, to demand so that's why bitcoin's so important is it, it allows you to build a healthy uh, electricity grid and provide energy for people so that they can advance their civilizations uh you know and, and not waste any energy and you know the important thing is that getting people to understand that bitcoin saves wasted energy and expands green power and once they do, once they figure that out, we're we're coasting. But that that's a, that's that's very important. So, you know, in a world where commerce and human rights and access to electricity are very permissioned and it's very unequal on all three fronts, you know, Bitcoin is this technology that that can improve your commercial ability. It can improve your freedom and 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 liberty, and it can improve your access to electricity. That this is a remarkable uh, sort of confluence of, of technologies, I would say. So that was sort of the point of my talk. Yeah. Isn't this also why Bitcoin is such a big idea and, and therefore also hard to understand? Like you, you mentioned these three things and, and they are all surfaced by 
the introduction of Bitcoin in, in these areas, right? But once you pitch that, it, it just sounds too good to be true for some people. How, how do you combat that or how do you yeah, dissect that? Do the math. Go run the numbers. Like go, <laughs> go try it for yourself. Like you can sit on your couch and send a Bitcoin transaction in minutes or in seconds with lightning to the West, somebody in West Bank or in Cuba or wherever. Like once you start to understand this, this is, how can you unlearn it? it the, the only possible scenario for someone like Paul Krugman is that they really, or Jamie Dimon or whatever, is they never used it. They never used it to do something that dollars can't do. Yeah. You know, if I can just help people understand that Bitcoin does a lot of things that the dollar can't do and it's profoundly useful. Then I think that I think I'll, I'll consider my time well spent. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of this concept of streaming money, right? Like we are streaming information all the time. We are currently streaming information, recording this this podcast, right? And I think the understanding that the exchange of money is the exchange of information, then you it's kind of like a shortcut to get to this like money should be streamable right and i think in areas i don't know like i i had this thought experiments once uh, once like let's say you're in africa and in in three different african countries they do the exact same thing they offer the exact same product or service but the reward for their time and energy is different in each of these countries which is just very i don't know like i think it's i think it's weird that human productivity gets rewarded in different ways whereas oh, it doesn't revenge. get rewarded i mean one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves is that things are getting cheaper uh, which they mm. should be due to technical technological innovation but you look at these people in poorer countries and stuff's getting more expensive like for them electricity electricity which they need so badly is getting more expensive because their mm. currency is collapsing yes and there's no capitalistic incentive to come in and expand the electric grid so Bitcoin just completely rewires that and fixes it because it gives them sats instead of Quacha or Naira or whatever, which is going to increase in value over time and is going to be, it works around the world. And it allows people to come in with a purely capitalistic incentive and framework and help them grow their power sources because it's no longer donations. It's like, oh, some company's gonna come in and take advantage of this free excess power you have here from this river and they're gonna take a cut and you're gonna pay less as a power company and the people are gonna pay less for their power. I mean, it's a yep. win, 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 win. There's no yep. losing. The only losing is the people crying about it on social media who are ignorant. <laughs> Oh, that's where I eventually wanted to go, right? Because the yeah. reward is so bad that, you know, you're not incentivized to build or improve or do anything, right? And so once your reward is actually a good reward, in our eyes, I think the best reward you can ever receive for your time and energy, then people can actually build and escape the current situation that they're in. Yeah, or at but, least it, but there is no, it. right, but there is no free lunch. Like Bitcoin is hard. Like mm -hmm. it's hard to understand. It's hard to adopt. It's hard to withstand, like meaning it's volatility. It's a harsh thing to to convert to. Once you're in, you're like, oh my god, of course. But like, it's yeah. it's hard when you see it. When the average person who's who doesn't understand that most currencies are all over the place, like most fiat currencies trade like uh, penny stocks. That's just the reality, and they could just lose half overnight. Like this is what happens all over the, all over the place. Americans don't understand that, especially rich Americans. They, they've never seen that. They're totally sheltered. So for them to see something lose 10% in a day or 15% in a day, like Bitcoin sometimes does, or gain 10% in a day, whatever, whatever um, they're like, whoa, no thanks. But what they're missing is what it's done over four years, eight years, 12 years, 16 years. Like it, it's, uh, as we enter the 16th year coming up, like it's, it's, um, I mean, it's like, hello, guys, this thing started at zero and it went to a penny, exactly. 10 cents, a yeah. dollar, two dollars, back to 30 cents, up to ten dollars, up to a hundred dollars, up to a thousand dollars, back to two hundred dollars, up to seventeen thousand dollars, back to three thousand dollars, up to seventy thousand dollars, back to fifteen thousand dollars, back up to seventy. Where are we going to go? I mean, it, it's very hard for people to stomach that. Uh, yeah. but that's the only way it could possibly happen because we have variable demand for a static and fixed and known supply. There's no, yeah. oh, well, there's not a lot of demand today. Let's make more. No, 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 no. 
that's 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 a trade-off you don't want to be making in your in your in the money that you're trying to make that's going to build uh the you know civilization for the next millennia yeah well, it's also truly free market, right? Like it has to prove itself as money. I mean, uh, we are recording this the day after we saw the huge, huge crashes in Bitcoin and the, and the stock market. And, you know, we see economy uh, PhDs calling for rate cuts to get cheaper money back in to, to prop up the stocks. Yeah, because they I cannot mean, oh, lose, you know? it's, I mean, yeah. it's funny. Oh, oh my God. We have to raise rates. Um, the economy is overheating. They don't give a shit that that's going to like totally crush the lives of billions of people in the global south. Um, oh, but now, you know, oh, now we got to cut, you know, now we got to cut. Okay. And what is that going to do? It's, it's like everybody's screwed all the time. Oh, well, if you cut, you know, then, 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 you know, it, it, it means everybody else has to cut. And it's like, it, 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 no, no one ever wins. It's, it's just always a rat race. It, it's, it, it, you know, people are going to zero and the debt's going to infinity and Bitcoin's the way. Out. You wrote a book called Check Your Financial Privilege. And we mm -hmm. just mentioned it a bit. How do you explain this concept of financial privilege to those who might not see the immediate need for Bitcoin in their daily lives? I mean, I this is something I encounter a lot with the people that I talk to um, about the fiat money system and eventually Bitcoin. Just got to show it through the stories of people. I mean, that's why I tried to open the book with three people and who are hopefully relatable, uh, normal people who are just doing their thing and they happen to use Bitcoin. It's very useful for them different backgrounds, different countries, but, you know, they're not legendary computer scientists or anything. They're just a uh, small business and entrepreneur. So I think it's got to be done with a human touch to reach the most people. Yeah. And, and that's a reach. That's not true. Uh, just talking about price and tokens and altcoins, that'll reach the most people. Uh, when I say True. reach, I really mean effect, impact, yeah. change the most people. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like this simple idea of if it can done, uh, can be done to to these people, where wherever they live, yeah. right, in another fiat money system, then it can also be done to you, right? But that's kind of what I oh, think. Oh, yeah. About. Like this idea that the dollar users are always going to be yeah. invincible from, I mean, we just saw 9% inflation in the United States, and that's like official official numbers. I mean, people know now that we're not we're not immune. I agree, but still, it's like we are we are kind of like the the last survivors in that sense, right? I think that's kind of what. Oh, no, no, no. They, they might they might uh, they, they, they might be in a position where they know things are rough, but they, 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 overwhelmingly they're in a position where they know things are rougher exactly. than, than they appear to be, but they don't understand Bitcoin yet. So, yeah, yeah. that's why I think the education piece is key. We just got to keep orange pilling. I mean, it's the most important thing. In 10 years, the only thing you're really going to regret is not telling more people about Bitcoin. Yeah. And so, to do it in a classy way that meets them where they are, you know? And what's the best way that you've discovered uh, for educating people in these developing regions? Well, I mean, look, I like to work with other people who are, who know what they're doing locally. Like I don't, okay, I've never been to Togo. Okay, great. So I can, find somebody who's doing awesome work there and support them. So I'm not going to necessarily, I mean, I want to go to some of these places where I, where I can to learn and, and to understand, but I'm not going to be the guy doing it. It's not going to be me. It's going to be someone from Togo uh, yeah. who can really explain it. And the, what we're doing at HRF is really trying to expand the pie of resources for um, Bitcoin education in, in, in difficult political climates and get that really going. Yeah. I always kind of prided myself that I figured out Bitcoin without actually having the problem. Um, but uh, a few weeks ago, Maya Parbu from Suriname, I don't know if you know her, she's, uh, she's yeah, going to yeah. run for, uh, for president there. Great. She explained to me, you know, like most people here in Suriname, they have $300 a month and they're just surviving every day, right? They don't yeah, even exactly. have time to think about money. Yeah, most people yeah. are not. Um... Yeah. That 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 was really a good moment for me to check my privilege. By the way, that that was a really good um, yeah. uh, response by her as well. Uh, but that's also why um, why I wanted to ask that question. I think it's just I also spoke to a guy from Kenya where he and he was like, "Yeah, you know, all these people are protesting in the streets. My friends, it's all messed up." And then I start talking about Bitcoin, and I think I'm fucking annoying. <laughs> and he's like, "Yeah, it's just even the people in these situations." Um, 
yeah, still find it hard to really understand what is going on, right? I think uh, that's also why just educating more people on Bitcoin is so important. It is. So you often connect financial systems with personal freedom and human rights. How has your understanding of this relationship shaped? And what do you think is the main thing people need to understand about the influence of money over their individual lives? Money permeates everything. Um, it's a profoundly unfair system. I mean, look, 4% of the world's population controls and issues and makes the rules for the money for everybody else. I mean, that that's, that's feudalism and that's where, 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 where we're at right now. And, uh, I know people make excuses. Well, I mean, everybody wants it that way. They want the dollar. They want this, they want that. Well, I mean, no, nah, really people don't want to have their currency devalued overnight. They, they don't want to use some crappy arcade, arcade token and people want good money for their families. Right. And no political constructs ever going to give that to them. Like the world has spoken very clearly about what it wants as a market. The political market of the world wants a feudal system where it can exploit people. So to enrich others, that's, 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 that's what humanity will do. If you give it fiat, that's what it will do. But if you give it Bitcoin, it's different. We'll see. We don't know if it's going to change like the overall paradigm of world powers and things like that. Who knows? What we do know is it gives people an escape out of the system into a new yeah. system where they can build a new life for themselves and have all kinds of incredible opportunities. I mean, Bitcoin is just this thing. It's weird. It's just money on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's like clearly not just money. It it's, provides community connection, unity, builds bridges, uh, everything that we need in a world of so many divides and war and death and ignorance and arrogance and cold hostility. I mean, this thing is just this warm force that's lighting everybody up. So the um, more we can do to promote it, the better we'll be. Love, love that. All right. My last two short questions. Mm -hmm. What are your long-term goals for Bitcoin advocacy and how would you measure success in, in the area that you're focusing on? I mean, we're trying to build, we have a webinar every quarter for nonprofits to help them integrate Bitcoin and building that up is a huge goal of ours, making that more professional, make it really good. Um, make it deliver the goods and, and just get I me mean, churning it out. So we've got 50 to 100 nonprofit leaders every quarter. I mean, that's really the goal of where we want to be early next year. Um, increasing our grant activity, um, reaching over a hundred different institutions, you know, giving over a hundred different institutions and individuals around the world support um, is a goal uh, every year. Uh, and we're getting close to both of those things. I think we're going to nail it. So, so we'll see. So we'll do Love that. We'll keep doing what we can. But thank you for having me. And you know, look, if you're millennial, um, you know, you're you're kind of stuck in between two different types of generations. But I think you're primed uh, pretty well for Bitcoin. I, I think you saw the rise of the internet when you were younger, and uh, like me, um, you saw this internet thing come in the '90s, and you started using it, and you were on dial-up modems probably, and um, and you started to see it grow beyond just email and messaging and, and, and become e-commerce and then change the world completely. And there were a lot of people when you first started using the internet that said, oh, this thing's a, a fad. This is going to go away. Yes. But you mm -hmm. knew even as a kid or a younger person that that's obviously not, I'm not going to go back from not using this. Well, this is, this is Bitcoin, just deja vu. Like we're not going to, I'm not going to go back to not using it. Like you have your mind, like that's kind of the, the way that we feel. So I think millennials can do a lot here. So yeah, carry the torch, let's move forward. Let's teach the people in front of us and back of us. Let's, let's move the thing. Yeah. One last question that I ask everyone and the answer can okay. be really short. What is a core belief that you will never let go? A core belief that I will never let go is that tyranny is bad. And I understand that people have this God emperor complex in me. They think that we need a good, strong leader to keep us in line. And I just think that that's just been proven wrong time and time and time and time and time again. And if you have a leader that's strong and a dictator, and you think they're good for most people, well, what about for the minority? So um, I think we just need to, you know, to reject tyranny. I think that that's like the biggest human goal because everything else about us, whether our objective is to preserve and expand our population, our civilization, our planet around us, our creative endeavors, our intellectual endeavors. Tyranny is bad for all those things. Like we need freedom. So freedom is good for all that stuff. So thanks for sharing and thanks for your say. time. Yeah, sure thing. All right, it was man. A pleasure, man. Thank you. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, check out some of my other episodes to learn why Bitcoin is the most important subject you must understand and adopt. If you want, you can follow and connect with me on Twitter X. I'm at Bram K, that's at B-R-A-M-K. And if you have any feedback or questions, just reach out. I read and reply to every single message. I appreciate your support and hope you'll be here for our next episode. Thanks for listening. Bye.